Welcome to another of the Scripture Roundtables put on by the Interpreter Foundation, uh, hosted by Interpreter, a, scripture, a journal of Mormon scripture. Uh, we are happy to welcome you again to another one of our installments on the Scripture Roundtables discussing the Gospel Doctrine uh, curriculum for this year, the Old Testament. Today we are going to be delving into Lesson 5, I believe, which is about Noah and the Tower of Babel. Uh, our participants today are across uh, your screen. We have Bruce Webster uh, and Jeff Bradshaw, Martin Tanner, and I am Andrew Smith. Um, this lesson should be a fairly interesting one for uh, those of us who take seriously uh, the biblical narratives, either as... Uh, methods of drawing closer to the Lord in our scripture study as well as allegorical accounts that have interesting meaning for us. Uh, we're going to be discussing quite a few aspects of uh, the Noah story as well as that of the Tower of Babel, time permitting. Um, so perhaps let's just jump right into it. Jeff, you wanted to uh, start off and give us some ideas about Noah and his life and his circumstances and situation. Sure, thank you. Um, Noah uh, is uh, just an amazing character and probably undervalued. Uh, uh, we get so caught up in the colorful history of the ark that we forget sort of the focus uh, in Jewish and Christian liter literature is him as a tzaddik, as, as a righteous uh, uh, person. In fact, he was so righteous that many traditions grew up around him, sort of highlighting his almost angelic or divine status when he was born. Book of Enoch tells us he opened his eyes and the whole house shone like the sun. He immediately began to talk. And uh, his three children, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, uh, are explicitly called the sons of God. Um, he, like Enoch, uh, walked with God, meaning, uh, according to some, that, they, that, that both Enoch and Noah attained eternal life while still on mortality. Uh, and uh, he also um, uh, was... In the in the genealogy and, and uh, list, he's one of the only ones besides Enoch who is not uh, listed as dying in many of the early accounts. He is translated just as Enoch is, whether or not we accept those. Uh, you find pictures of him in the um, some of the early Christian tombs in the pose of resurrection, showing that he was a figure of Christ uh, and, and prefiguring his uh, his uh, ministry and his death and resurrection, uh, in a sense. Um, and then um, both Enoch and he found life amidst the curse of death, both were rescued from death by the hand of God, and each in turn was a rescuer to others. So it's easy to see why he was so revered. His sons, uh, as I mentioned, were called the sons of God, and that's been no end of confusion for people. Um, uh, and frankly, it would be for the LDS too, had we not had uh, the benefit of modern revelation. Uh, the basic gist is that um, some traditions take uh, this notion of uh, the story about the sons of God and the daughters of men as being an account of angels mating with human women. Uh, but uh, both uh, some statements from Joseph Smith uh, and some early Christian traditions and uh, the Book of Moses itself argue against that interpretation. It's very clear when it talks about uh, Noah's sons being the sons of God, it was their priesthood role, in essence, without going into any depth here. It was really their righteousness that's being referred to. They had no divine status. Uh, later on, there's an interesting set of verses, um, verse 30, uh, uh, sorry, verse 20 and 21 of chapter 8, that says, And it came to pass that Noah called upon the children of men, they should repent, and they hearkened not unto his words. And after that they had heard them, it came up before him, saying, Behold, we are the sons of God. Let me just stop there. The people speaking... Uh, are not the sons of Noah, but they are basically the, the wicked who didn't respond to Noah's preaching. And they are, when they call themselves the sons of God here, mockingly doing so. Uh, and then again they say, have we not taken our, unto ourselves the daughters of men? Again, it's, it's sort of a mocking tone that they're, doing to, they're giving to Noah, which is easy to miss just reading the account. Noah's, these, the daughters referred to, are really the daughters of the quote unquote sons of God, the daughters of the sons of Noah. So they're calling, inverting the whole scheme, calling themselves basically the sons of man, according to Noah, uh, sons of God, and calling those wives that they've taken, who are really the daughters of the sons of God, the daughters of men. 
Uh, Joseph Smith uh, went on to um, say in one account, I think it's in the diaries of Charles Walker, that the idea of uh, hum the angels and humans uh, mating was contrary to divine law. And so that plus uh, the more straightforward account we have in, in the book of Moses tells us that, uh, gives us a better interpretation of this passage than the idea that it was angels mating with human women. And this, by the way, was, was very much in accord with at least the uh, interpretations by the Eastern Church in the early days from the Syrian, as well as the Muslim tradition, who said explicitly uh, these were just the righteous and not uh, divine beings. Yeah, some interesting points. Uh, it's some interesting terminology that I think is is easy for us to to get mixed up about. Uh, you know, we sing we sing "I am a child of God," and and then mix up ideas with you know humans as the the literal offspring of God as spirit children at the least but then you know how does that work out with divine status and and what what all of that means for us but it, it's interesting to see it also you, you see some usage related to that in the Doctrine and Covenants with ideas of holders of the priesthood are the the sons of God or the church of the firstborn or different things like that that they're that they're talking about titles that relate to priesthood holdership perhaps more than other things um, okay well any other thoughts then about uh, Noah and his uh, circumstances with people refusing to believe his message or do we move well, right on into <laughs> I think we've got to leave, leave that uh, sad story a little bit and uh, mm -hmm. get on with the building. We've got a lot to uh, talk yeah. about today. It's a wonderful story. Okay, well, let's uh, move then to the idea of the ark as well as the flood. Now, there's been a lot of uh, words spent and ink spilt over the years discussing uh, what exactly we mean when we talk about the flood and uh, how literally or figuratively or... Uh, in whatever way we should take uh, we should take this story. So, Martin, you wanted to talk a little bit about the approaches to uh, the story of the flood and the ark. I, I would be happy to do that. O over the years, I've had emails and questions from uh, people at church and on the radio asking about the flood and whether it should be taken literally or figuratively or, or how to approach it. And my usual response is, is that um, I know faithful Latter-day Saints who have at least three different approaches to how they view the Genesis Flood. One of those is that Noah was a real person described in Genesis 6, and there was a global flood, and it covered the entire earth, including the highest mountains. Now, you can have some... Uh, um, scientific problems with, with that, and, and there may be some facts that you will have to interpolate and, and say uh, that science has changed or that the geography of the earth has changed to, in, in order to make that work, but that's a position that I know many Latter-day Saints would, would believe. Um, a second position would be that Noah was a real person and that the flood described in Genesis was an accurate description of a first-person account of somebody who lived in the area where this large localized flood occurred. That happened to have been the position that Hugh Nibley took. So he thought it was a real event, but it was a localized flood. Uh, there are a number of uh, flood myths and epics around the world, but not just there, specifically in, in the Middle East that might give credence, although there are some dating issues involved with them, which we need not get into here. The third position, and there are some Latter-day Saints who, who believe this, although I think it's a little bit difficult because of um, uh, some of the, the, the visions that Joseph Smith saw, particularly the one in the Kirtland Temple and its interpretation um, by church leaders that Noah actually appeared to him and was a real person. The third position is that this is uh, an allegory, that this is uh, a myth or a parable, and that these events are to remind us of God's power and the importance of obeying his, his commandments. That's not the position that I personally espouse, but I know believing Latter-day Saints who, who would take that third position. 
the real importance, I think, of, of the um, science and, and the real issues about the historicity of, of the event m might be summarized this way. We're never going to come to a complete conclusion based on the available science. It's just not there like for the rest of the Bible. And, and that's not the purpose of the Bible. But the trend in archaeology and science has been to show that much of what used to be believed by biblical scholars to be allegory in the last hundred years or so have, have uh, become to be more and more accepted as literal events and, and uh, actual people. For example, in 1974 in Syria, the clay tablets of Ebla were found, more than 35,000 of those, and they specifically mention Lot, Abraham, Sodom, and Gomorrah, and a number of other people, including Noah. Uh, those are quite dramatic statements in ancient documents that were not specifically um, spiritual in nature, religious in nature. They, they, some of them talk in, uh, in terms uh, that are more um, secular in, in their setting, and those kinds of things have pushed scholars who wanted to take more of a mythological position uh, back on their heels. And so the trend is, is towards taking some of the events of, of uh, Genesis much more literally. All the details about the flood and how it could have occurred and how the ark could have occurred, we, we don't know. But there are some tantalizing bits of information. Uh, we read in the Book of Mormon about shining stones being the way that the Jaredites were able to see in their barges. And some of the uh, ancient Jewish commentaries talk about shining stones being the way that the ark was illuminated at a time when, of course, electricity would not have been uh, available. Joseph Smith could not possibly have known about these ancient Jewish commentaries, and I find it fascinating that the Book of Mormon comes up with the same uh, mode of giving light to an ancient prophet who desired to um, follow God and, es and escape a, uh, a group of people that they were part of that um, were wicked. The other point that I wanted to make about the Ark and the story is that the most important part of it is really not what I've been talking about so far, and that would be its historicity. The purpose of discussing that is to sort of lay um, a base upon which faith can can foster. The importance of the story, uh, story of Noah's Ark is, of course, that it's important for us to obey God and that there are blessings attached to obeying God. And these are stark and real in the Genesis story of Noah and his ark. Specifically, Noah and his family who obeyed God were saved. They were literally saved, and those who did not obey God died. Um, this is a story where the good prosper and the wicked perish. And that's a story that recurs over and over again in the Bible and in the statements of, uh, of, of prophets. Our Book of Mormon tells us over and over again that by obeying God's commandments, we will prosper in the land. And that's the story of Noah and his ark. And I guess with that short little background, uh, I'll pass the baton on to whoever wants to, to carry yeah. things from now on. Yeah. No, thank you for that that overview. I think I think a lot of that overview is applicable both to us as Latter Day Saints, but it seems to, you know, encapsulate a lot of uh, the views that are popular among all all varieties of believers, other Christians, perhaps uh, believing Jews, etc., who who look to the Bible for their their ability to to understand Holy Writ, but are also interested in in science and and what the sciences of the day can can add to us. Now. Beyond that, I think the uh, Mormons, specifically uh, LDS believing audiences, have have other sources that that can help us understand and, and better uh, better see these these things in relation to uh, the scientific knowledge that we're gaining in these in these eras as well. Um, specifically, we're not 
as ex as explicitly bounded by uh, the words in the Bible um, as some of our Protestant friends are or others uh, would be. Um, now, Bruce, you had another alternative, perhaps looking at the the looking at the flood from explicitly Mormon LDS standpoints in Revelation. What can you share with us? Yeah, and this actually ties in well with what Martin's been saying. Uh, it's sort of a number two theory. In other words, there was a Noah, there was an event that became interpreted as the flood, uh, but it, uh, <clears throat> but it's not the world being covered completely in water around 2350 BC. Uh, I fully believe the Lord could do that if He wanted to. He did create the universe after all. Uh, but the issue is not just geological evidence; it's specific, specifically biological evidence and anthropological evidence uh, would look dramatically different with that kind of event. Now, interestingly enough, it is it is LDS scripture which suggests an alternative interpretation. Uh, we tend, or I, let me put it this way, Christian world, the conservative Christian world, tends to be tied in on the 4004 uh, BC date for the creation of the world, fall of Adam, so on and so forth, deriving that from the Bible. However, Nephi, a son of Helaman, uh, in preaching, pushes that date way back. Specifically, in Helaman 8.18, he says, He's talking about those before, who before Abraham were called to the priesthood and who knew of Christ. He said, and this that it should be shown unto the people a great many thousand years before his coming, that even redemption should come unto them. Uh, now you might say, well, a great many thousands simply means a lot of years, but if you actually search the Book of Mormon for the usage of the phrase great many and great many thousand, it is always used in account sense. It talks about there being a great many thousand Nephites living in the land. It talks about great many, you know, great many widows, great many towns. Uh, so, and I, I would argue simply that four is not great many. So now you have an issue where the Antediluvian patriarchs were living far, far earlier than 4,000 BC, and once you get back to around 12, 11,000 BC. You hit a very interesting period. You have the end of the uh, older Dryas uh, Ice Age. The world warms up to a point that is just about at the same level as it is now. Very pleasant climate worldwide. There's a brief period when this is happening. And then you have a rapid onset of what's called the Younger Dryas Cold Period. Uh, the uh, geologists say it, it appears that this may have commenced in uh, about a decade's time, and possibly shorter than that. And the Earth over the period cools off almost to where it was in the previous Ice Age. This period lasts about 1,200 years, and then it warms up. Now, the other interesting thing is that the trigger for the Younger Dryas and the events surrounding it seem to be centered on North America, uh, which is where DNC uh, uh, Doctrine and Covenants places Adam on Ionaman, the Atrigluvian patriarchs. Uh, the events are varied. There, there, there are three competing explanations for the onset of the Younger Dryas. One is a bursting of uh, an ice dam and a uh, depression of the uh, North Atlantic circulatory system. One is an eruption of a volcano in Germany. One is uh, an extraterrestrial impact over the Laurentide ice sheet, which was covering North America northern U.S. and all of Canada at that point. And each side has its arguments and its evidences and so on. But what you do have is you have, with the onset of the Younger Dryas, you have tremendous climatic change in North America. The Clovis people who were inhabiting at the time vanish. There is a tremendous die-off of the megafauna uh, in that period. And the question becomes, if the antediluvian patriarchs were living in North America, you know, you have Adam, Adam on Diamond, uh, in, uh, in what's now in the U.S. How did they get to the Middle East? And the answer is simply, and this, this gets back to what was uh, uh, brought up, I think, by Martin. Uh, you have basically a reverse migration as with the Jaredites and as with Lehi. Uh, God knows the catastrophe that's going to happen, the changes that are going to happen in North America. 
It's going to enter an ice age. Uh, he wants to get them somewhere where it's going to be more habitable. Has no build a ship, stock it with livestock, load his family. They set off across the Atlantic. If Noah is not familiar with oceans, traveling across an ocean, particularly under stormy circumstances, is going to look like the whole Earth is flooded. You know, he may, he may see islands here and there, uh, particularly as he gets closer, if, assuming he's crossing the Atlantic, he could cross Pacific, but assuming he's crossing the Atlantic, particularly as he gets close to either Europe or Africa, he's going to run across uh, some of the small island groups that will look like mountains poking out of the, the ocean, arrives in the old world, and you've got the, the transport over there. The point is this is all, all happening around 11,000 B.C. So you've got a flood story with Noah, an actual event, an actual migration, but the story has time to propagate among several of the, and probably many of the cultures that have a corresponding uh, flood story. And, intriguingly enough, with the, the whole concept of water recovering the tops of the mountains, uh, what you have in this, this era is renewed glaciation uh, in various parts of the world. Now, someone in the Middle East, if you tell them that ice was covering the top of a mountain, you had glaciers, they probably wouldn't know what you're talking about, but they would identify ice with water. So when you've got things such as the water receding off the land, the phrase from the Book of Mormon, or water covering the tops of the mountains, uh, the reference simply could be glaciation. Now, do I think that's the answer? No. But the point is, is that we with modern scriptures, or modernly revealed scriptures, have a different perspective on time frames, events, and geography than comes across from the Bible. Yeah, and I think it's it's important for us to, to measure all of those things against one another and to, yeah. to use our reason as well as uh, rely on revelation and as well don't let it fully affect your ability to believe, you know. They're, the answer, I don't know, is, is sometimes a, the only answer that can really be reassociated. Um, is there anything else? I think, Jeff, you said you might have something about localized flood or... Yeah, maybe I can uh, just say one word about that and then go on to maybe mm -hmm. something about the construction of the ark itself. Right. Uh, just briefly, I guess I just said, identify myself with the number two group that Martin had and with uh, those such as Hugh Nibley. And I, I do want to emphasize the point, I don't think we have to throw out the Bible to do so. No. Um, uh, for example, when it talks about the whole earth being covered, the word used is the Hebrew Aretz, which mm -hmm. can be just as easily mean the whole land. And uh, it's used uh, that way both in the Book of Mormon as well as in other places, uh, something we can't go into depth here, but again, I think uh, an interpretation such as the ones we've heard, uh, the whole land, doesn't have to mean that we're um, uh, inconsistent with the Bible in that way. Also, uh, I, I like a statement that Elder Widso made that said, you know, when prophets and those who write inspired scripture report on events, it's uh, according to the things that they've seen and heard, unless uh, they're given specific inspiration otherwise. And uh, that he said in the case of the flood, uh, Noah was reporting what he accurately saw. And he said in other places there could have been more or less water. So I think that's a very significant statement from Elder Widso. Yeah, yeah, it's important. It's important to understand that uh, everybody that was writing these things was context oriented, uh, as well as us in our own context and situation as we encounter them. Uh, it, it's, it's very easy to to misunderstand or misattribute things such as, you know, the, the KJV or other scriptures using the word earth and then because in our modern parlance earth is a capital E meaning the entire planet, suddenly we're, we're making assumptions that do not bear out in the text and uh, it becomes very important for us to, to understand our contextuality and, and where that's going. Um, now let's move on then to under, or looking specifically at the arc and certain literary and contextual connections that the Ark has with other with other areas. Um, you had some things, Jeff, and we have some other connections that we're we're going to talk about. Would you like to jump into those? Sure, and please jump in because I know you're going to talk yeah. about some of the vocabulary in the Ark too. Um, the one thing that you're going to miss uh, a lot of, uh, about if you don't uh, look carefully is the connections between the Ark and the Temple uh, or the Tabernacle, as it were. 
Uh, you first of all notice that the Ark is the only other building in the Bible whose dimensions are revealed uh, directly by God to Noah in this case. And so that immediately signals uh, a temple kind of building activity. Uh, like the tabernacle, uh, Noah's Ark was, uh, had um, three decks or three divisions of the tabernacle. And, and uh, there, those who, like myself, see a similar threefold layout in the Garden of Eden as a, as a temple prototype. Uh, in fact, each of the three decks of Noah's Ark was exactly the same height as the tabernacle and three times the area of the tabernacle court. And we have the same Hebrew word mixa, which was used for the animal skin covering of the Ark and that of the tabernacle. So, um, again, if we're given details like dimensions of the ark or number of days or the day on which uh, our, uh, Noah and his uh, family landed, uh, we, if uh, we're given those kind of details, they're usually because they reverberate through stories elsewhere in the Old Testament. In this case, I think very strong temple connections. We find uh, also that the, boat, the, the ark was not... Um, built like a boat. It had a flat bottom. It was rectangular in shape. No, in no way could it be steered by oars. Uh, basically, they are at the will and mercy of God as they floated through things, just as the ark, it uses the same word in the Bible, the ark of, of uh, Moses, the baby Moses, when he was floating down the river. Mm -hmm. It was completely by God's will that this happened. Um, and uh, the ark of the tabernacle, interestingly enough, which uh, 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 is described using the uh, the word teva that later became the standard work for the uh, I mean the the Ark of the Covenant the same word later became a standard in Mishnaic Hebrew too, and um, the Ark of the Covenant also has the ratio of the width to the height as three to five, so uh, both the shape of the Ark and the um, and the the etym uh, etymology of the words that were later used to describe it again point us to the temple inside was all creation. And the materials of the ark also suggest a temple kind of uh, materials if you go to, uh, especially if you're looking at the Mesopotamian uh, accounts on the side. What do we have in Genesis? It says, you know, we're going to have gopher wood. Nobody knows what gopher wood is, but many people think it was some kind of uh, resinous wood such as cypress, which was interestingly enough used to build temple doors temples, uh, ships actually, and coffins, all things that have um, a great uh, significance to them. We have uh, kofer, a very similar word, which is used for pitch. And maybe, Andrew, you're going to say something about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can oh. jump in there. Just to, to piggyback off of your, your discussion of the tevat, the ark, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting word in the Hebrew. Like you said, you know, all these other things that are built with that, the Looking at the word, it it looks to be an Egyptian loan word that comes in that originally meant chest or coffin, and yeah. so Noah quite literally is building his own his own coffin that he is figuratively going to be going into death uh, and then and then being brought out of death. But uh, another interesting connection is that there's there's very few places that this word is also used, and the other one is uh, the use it's. It's what Moses, Moses' mother, puts Moses in when she places him into, into the Nile uh, to bear him off and save his life, as it were, from, from destruction. Uh, a very similar uh, figurative type scene that's going on. Um, so seeing them, Mo, Noah and his family, as well as Moses, being placed in a vessel of this resinous wood, uh, this, this wood that... Uh, quite literally may be looked at as having some sort of lifeblood, having them die and then being resurrected via a vessel of wood uh, is a very interesting interesting literary connection, uh, especially coming from a Christian viewpoint. Now, how others would view that uh, is also another interesting idea, and you brought up uh, the word kafar, uh, kofar, uh, which is used uh, throughout the, the idea that uh, in, one, in one meaning means pitch, uh, but it's the same triconsonant root and the same word that throughout the the Levitical accounts and the law and whatnot means to pro, to provide propitiation or atone for sin, um, and so it's it's quite clear that whoever the author is uh, of this text knows what they are saying and is deliberately making a wordplay 
uh, off of these words to direct their their audience to understand this as a a temple being constructed, uh, a a floating temple that will uh, keep and provide life, which you know is just wrapped up in all kinds of understandings of what the temple did for ancient civilizations and societies. It it was the thing that brought life and kept life going. So. I love what you say there, you know, it becomes the vessel of salvation just like the temple is a salvation for, for all of us, ancient and modern Israel. Um, and it's interesting that um, the action of smearing or wiping in the temple, which is associated with the altar of the temple, are the same way you apply the pitch. Yep. So that's uh, the gopher. So uh, that's very uh, interesting connection right there as well. Yeah, and you, uh, you get a lot of then interesting connections through uh, through art and literature and whatnot with the the anointing then of the cross with the blood of Christ uh, as another vessel of salvation uh, for for all of mankind, which is an interesting one. Let me say something. Think about the uh, mysterious component in the uh, in the description of the ark's materials, um, and that is the word rooms. You know, it talks about the co gopher wood, it talks about the uh, pitch, and then it says rooms thou shalt build in it. And and it's a word that's had a lot of different translations because people, Bible translators, don't have a good idea what to make of it. Um, and uh, it's interesting when you look at the stories of Atrahasis, the Gilgamesh, the Mesopotamian stories. They have tree materials too, uh, they have the, the wood, um, and they have, which is a frame in their case, they have the, um, uh, the pitch, and then they have uh, reeds, and so the idea there in ancient Mesopotamian shipbuilding is that you attach these reed mats to the, to the wood frame to build a boat. Now that itself is of, of great interest. Uh, and it becomes of further interest to the temple connections when you read in those stories that reed huts uh, were used as sanctuaries. And so the reed hut, the, the kind of architecture we're, we're talking about, and in fact, Gilgamesh, in the story of Gilgamesh, the flood hero obtains the construction buildings for the building of his boat by tearing down a reed hut, a temple. Basically, he disassembles the temple, puts it on the prow, let's just say, of a boat, uh, that's maybe uh, a caricature of what really happened, but imagine that. And then this hut uh, is, is that sanctuary is rebuilt in this floating, uh, as a floating temple. And uh, so that's very significant. Uh, modern Bible scholars, going back to the biblical account, have taken that, um, the Hebrew uh, of the word for rooms and realizing that, uh, I think as, 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 as most people know, uh, the vowels in Hebrew were um, not always uh, present in the words, and that sometimes words were um, uh, different versions of the words could be made by repointing or putting different uh, vowels on there. It turns out that if you point the word for rooms in a certain way, uh, you also get the word read. So it would be then, instead of rooms, you have pitch. Uh, the, the gopher wood, and then these uh, the, the reeds of which the ark was made. Again, if you take those Mesopotamian stories as a guide, it becomes very important for the symbolism of the temple uh, aboard the ark. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, it's just, it's an interesting word. I don't remember if it's the exact same word, but uh, the Red Sea that Moses crosses with, with the Israelites is probably better translated as reed sea in many of the instances. Uh, and just another connection there that that literarily you have a lot of these these themes that are pushing people towards a salvational type of aspect. Well, and you pointed out yourself uh, the story of Moses, the same word for ark, and it's a reed basket. Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt yeah. about that. So it's the symbolism is very very significant there. Yeah, and then of course you know as I think Martin already mentioned the Jaredite barges in the Book of Mormon that, oh, are, yeah. that are talked about as being made tight like unto a dish. You know the. The teenagers always get a kick out of that phrase because, you know, we don't describe things that way. Um, but in the ancient world, if you're going to make something in, out of wood and you're going to make it tight, you have to do it with some sort of, you know, connector resin or uh, swipe wiping it with some sort of 
pitch of some sort, and so it, it's, it seems very clear that the Jaredites are deliberately speaking uh, in similar language to what we know from, from Noah. Well, the other they, phrase they actually oh, say they, they actually ahead, say that they make it tight like into the Ark of Noah. Yeah, yeah, it makes it explicit. Yeah. And another connection there is it says uh, something to the effect that uh, what you said uh, just reminded me, Bruce, uh, uh, that um, uh, they were light as fowls upon the water. Yeah. And it was interesting, <laughs> I found in some of the Mesopotamian sto uh, stories the uh, same description used of the ships as being uh, like uh, ducks or waterfowl upon the waters, which is just another striking bullseye for the Book of Mormon and the description of the Ark and the Jaredite barges, as you guys pointed out. Yeah, yeah. Well, not a lot of things float, uh, for certain. <laughs> uh, and I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm just left thinking of Monty Python, a duck. <laughs> uh, but, okay, um, are there any other than ideas and thoughts anybody has about the construction of the Ark? One, one Ark. quick comment, and, and that's just mm -hmm. a reference to the um, Epic of Gilgamesh that was mentioned by Jeff. Some of our listeners to this roundtable may not really know what that is, and, and the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh is a flood story that's similar in, in quite a few details to the story of Noah and his Ark, and it's revered by a different group of people who were separate from the Jews, and it, it had the same kinds of ideas associated with it. So you, you could uh, take a look at Gilgamesh as being similar to Noah, and, and the story of the flood is, is the uh, same kind of a background that you find in the epic of Gilgamesh. I'll leave it there. Oh, that's good. That's some good thought. Um, some other interesting thoughts. I don't know if they'll provoke any di discussion, but uh, I, I just love reading through it again and noting that in the biblical text, uh, the somewhat the, the reversal of, of creation. When you get into to chapter 6, um, the, the Lord is talking about everything. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Uh, the Lord's going to get him and covenant. He talks about the covenant uh, and of the things that he's going to take, and he's going to destroy uh, all of the... Uh, doo -doo -doo, destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beasts and the creeping things and the fowls of the air, for repenteth me that I have made them. Uh, just a couple ideas there. that It's, it's reversing uh, the, the creation. It's the re-rolling up of creation and like... A, like Jeff said, you know, what is inside of the ark? Well, it's it's the creation. The Lord is rolling up as a scroll somewhat all of his creation and consigning the rest of, of the area back to chaos uh, and then re recreating it once the, the ark is opened out again. Some interesting things uh, going on. Uh, but another interesting note is the idea of covenant language uh, that the Lord has got going with Noah. Uh, there's a lot of different usages. We, we talked about uh, Noah as being uh, the, the man who walked with God uh, in Genesis 6, the end of uh, the, or verse 9, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. In the Hebrew, that sentence stands out even, even more than what it would kind of jumps out at us in the English, uh, because it's got some weird syntax. Uh, it, it goes along and then it it comes with et Elohim hitchalech Noah, which normally, you know, syntax goes verb, subject, object, or maybe subject, verb, object, but this, it sticks the object with God forward in the sentence to, to add greater emphasis to it. Uh, and this, this verb, meaning to walk, is an interesting form. It's not the normal just holech, walking. Uh, it's in a different form that is not used as often. And in comparison, uh, it comes up another time here in Genesis, in Genesis 17, uh, in the, the first verse, Abram is talking uh, to the Lord. The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee. Uh, this then could, could definitely be a covenantal language uh, that the Lord has set the... Uh, the restrictions, these are the conditions upon which the Lord will make the covenant. Uh, and as we see throughout the rest of this, 
uh, Noah comes up with a, a very strong covenant from the Lord uh, in a lot of different ways. And there's a lot more to talk about there that I don't know if we're going to get into. Um, should we move on real quick to the Tower of Babel, if nobody else has anything to say about um, I don't know if we have the time, but I just want to say a word about the uh, the mysterious incident about the drunkenness of Noah. Could I just say? Oh yeah, something yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to say I really uh, uh, agree with your uh, characterization of the um, uh, the Noah uh, no, the flood as being an undoing of creation. In fact, the words that are used for the ark moving on the face of the water are mm -hmm. used uh, only in one other place, and that is in the story of creation, where the Spirit of God is hovering on the water. So we have a very nice parallel there. And then we also have, a, you know, instances to replicate the garden. Noah plants a garden uh, in the role of God planting a garden in Eden. And then what we would have, what I would call a story of a fall and judgment almost in, in Chapter 9. Now, most people think the object of that story is Noah, who is... Um, reprimanded perhaps or not explicitly in the Bible but somewhat uh, denigrated because of his role in uh, uh, becoming drunken and, and exposing himself in his tent to his son Ham who is also condemned. Uh, note though that Noah is never condemned in the Bible. In fact he's the one who like God in the Garden of Eden gives judgment. Uh, he pronounces it upon uh, Canaan interesting enough we don't have time to go into that but Canaan in the Zohar is likened to the serpent uh, which could be taken as he was the one who egged, uh, egged uh, Ham on in, in what he did. Um, Joseph Smith, uh, I mean, so uh, the interesting thing about the, the, that incident, I'm trying to be real quick here, is that when it talks about the tent in which Noah entered, it doesn't say his tent, as we have in the Bible. It actually says her tent. And the Zohar and some of the early Jewish interpreters take that to mean not the tent of his wife, but the tent of Shekinah, in other words, the tent of Jehovah, which it would have been very logical for him to have built with the altar in front at the foot of the mountain where they landed. And so uh, uh, that ties in very well with uh, another statement that I found from Joseph Smith, again, the diary of Charles Lowell Walker. It's reported as a recollection that Joseph Smith said, Noah was not drunk, but in a vision. Uh, and uh, Kohler and Greenspan, among other modern commentators, uh, so Joseph Smith wasn't alone, said that Ham's misdeed was looking upon God while Noah was in the course of revelation. Uh, we also find that same idea in the Genesis Apocryphon, where, just, uh, where we find Noah, after having drink, drunk this ceremonial wine, which is described very much in the likeness of the language of, of uh, Melchizedek later coming to Abraham and the kinds of blessings occurred, that, um, uh, let's see, I'm losing my thread here, that, uh, oh, that uh, Noah had a vision uh, immediately after that ceremonial drinking of the wine, which took place on a, on a certain day of ritual. So we find agreement with Joseph Smith in, in, in many of the scholars that, and it makes more sense with the story uh, to think mm -hmm. about uh, Noah's um, vision of God presaging the covenant you mentioned, Andrew, as opposed to uh, you know being weary and and uh, drinking too much uh, after a particularly wearying day, as we might otherwise suppose. So it's very very uh, interesting connections there, and then again goes with the notion of a fall. Uh, there's a lot of the symbolism is very much like the story of, of uh, Adam and Eve's transgression as they approach the tent of the Lord. I'll just leave that there. No, thank you. Well, we are coming. Quickly to the end of our time, do we want to take just a couple minutes to hit the highlights of some of what you guys consider the highlights of the Tower of Babel stories? Jeff and Martin, you both have things to add here. Um, I'll, I'll take a quick crack at that. The, the Tower of Babel is one of those um, parts of the Old Testament that for a long time was considered probably myth or legend, but... Uh, modern scholarship and archaeology has shown that we have probably found, or at least know of, not really found, uh, the Tower of, of Babel. Uh, the precursor to the pyramids were structures known as ziggurats, and they were stepped pyramids. One of those that's found just uh, north of present-day Baghdad, Iraq, is called Etemenanki which is considered by many archaeologists and scholars to be literally the, the Tower of Babel. 
most of the ziggurats um, referenced a god or perhaps a great ruler. This particular one, the name of it means the temple of the foundation of heaven and earth, very reminiscent of the description of the Tower of Babel in Genesis. And uh, so literally outside of Baghdad we, we have uh, the, the Tower of Babel. We also have descriptions of it by uh, the king of Babylon at the time and his descriptions are also quite reminiscent of the Tower of Babel. I'd quote them, but we are virtually out of time. So, so with that statement, uh, I'll just mention that the Tower of Babel shows that there was a real structure, probably about the size of a 30-story building, that was literally built uh, by the King of Babylon to um, reference itself as the foundation of heaven and earth, which shows a great deal of pride and arrogance associated with it, which is the sin that seems to be associated with the Tower of Babel in Genesis. That's a great yeah. summary. Could, could I comment? Yeah. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I agree with, uh, uh, with Martin that this is an area where uh, archaeology has uncovered some striking uh, parallels with ancient Mesopotamian uh, construction techniques, and almost certainly the, uh, the uh, Tower of Babel description is describing a ziggurat. Um, the uh, time frame is the one thing that is uncertain. I, I, for one, would say that the time of Nebuchadnezzar II, uh, in, uh, when the, uh, uh, the Etim Menanchi was, was created, the latest version of it, is probably too late for the Tower of uh, Babel story. Um, uh, but we know that these uh, kinds of temple settings were, were constructed and reconstructed on the same type over and over. So it's possible yeah. it could go as early as the 4th millennium B.C., according to John Sorensen, or as Grant Gardner's taken as late as, say, 1100 B.C. Those, that range of dates seems appropriate. The yeah. question... Let, let me, let me thro throw in one thing really quickly, and that is that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar II, who you mentioned, specifically says that he is rebuilding an ancient structure, although he doesn't mention the earlier king, so you're absolutely right. It, it certainly does date to an earlier time, and that's probably the appropriate setting. Thanks. Exactly right. Um, the thing that everybody, of course, uh, wants to know is what about this confounding of languages? And mm -hmm. as a scientist and as a, as a disciple, I guess, I think that there is a way of interpreting this story in a way that's not inconsistent with what we know about evolutionary linguistics. Um, Gee, to be real brief here, um, we don't have, first of all, a story of the whole world wandering. In fact, in the Book of Mormon, we have, we say, the people wandered into the area. In uh, the, uh, where is it, um, in the Joseph Smith translation, we also have the idea that many wandered into the area. So it may not have been all of humanity. Similarly, we don't have um, the idea of all spoke one universal prototype language, we have, again, it's modified a little bit Joseph Smith translation. They said they all spoke the same language. And uh, I think a great idea by some, uh, some uh, folks that I've encountered is the idea that we're not talking about a universal prototype language here, such as an Adamic language. Again, the timing for evolutionary linguistics would just be way off. Uh, we know that many languages existed long before this incident could have taken place. Uh, but that it was a... It was a uh, lingua franca, as it were, such as Akkadian, Sumerian, or even Aramaic, if you take it, the, the incident is occurring very late, that people from many nations that we know came together to build such structures in the Babylonian Empire used to communicate with each other. So this confounding is about two things, as, as Hugh Nibley uh, especially talked about. It's about the wrongful mixing of peoples in this culture, the covenant people with the non-covenant, going with that theme that runs through all the early chapters of Genesis, and then the disappearance of this lingua franca, which enabled them to engage in a cooperative venture, such as the Tower of Babel, which would have given them uh, hegemony uh, in a way that would spread their uh, uh, wickedness throughout the earth. And so uh, when you look at it that way, we don't have to dismiss uh, this whole thing as fable. We have a story that can make sense in terms of its historic, archaeological, and even linguistic setting. And so that's, that's the uh, anyway, view that makes most sense to me. Let me add just one other thought on there, too, uh, that builds on that. 
considering the, the general state of cities in the world at this time, and I, and I tend to lean towards a uh, you know 3000 BC ish time frame for it. What you may well have had was uh, the core of a city where there was at least a working lingua franca, and as the tower is being built, it begins to draw population from a wider and wider uh, range, and these populations are going to typically have their own variant dialects and so on. What you may have actually had was, uh, in effect, a uh, civic collapse that too many people were drawn into the civic center uh, without the necessary time to actually learn the lingua franca and the population in, in essence overwhelmed uh, what civic structure was there based on this common language and the city the city collapsed and people had to disperse back to the countryside. I mean, This is a phenomenon we often see uh, in parts of the world where you have sudden industrialization, you have people move from the countryside into the city uh, because of what they see as economic opportunity, and the city becomes overwhelmed. Uh, we may have had something similar happen. The other just interesting note is that uh, you know the Book of Mormon attests to the Tower of Babel, but one of the one of the nice things is that it does not call it the Tower of Babel. Joseph Smith were simply making up or inventing the Book of Mormon. It would have been very easy to develop a backstory and to call it Babel and the Tower of Babel. All it ever refers to it is the Great Tower, uh, which to me is, is a sign of authenticity of the Jaredite record that it does not try to interpolate 19th century sensibilities about the Great Tower onto the story. I think that's a great point, and, and Hugh Nibley, in fact, uh, just, just one other alternative point of view, took this great tower of the Jaredites as being something separate from the Tower of Babel, which he came, which came later in his view. So that's another uh, thing to, to maybe well. investigate if you're interested. Yeah. Um, maybe one other thing to comment on real quick is, is that okay. scattering you mentioned uh, is, is really the theme here. We don't find any necessary connection between the confounding of the, if you read the account carefully, the confounding of the language and the scattering. The message here is just as what happened with the, the Jaredite people, God saw uh, um, uh, his, his purposes being contravened and so caused uh, this, this, this confounding to result uh, and uh, this construction project to result in confusion and the scattering of people uh, throughout the earth, all as a setup for instead of um, uh, this great people inheriting the land and making a name for themselves, we read in Genesis 12, 2, that God himself is going to make a name for Abraham. So instead of having the people make a name for themselves, he's, it's all this pointing out is God's hand in confusing the Babel, Babelians, I guess we can call them, and mm -hmm. setting up the, the uh, later migration of, of Abraham and his righteousness and a chosen people who later become Israel. Yep, which brings us all back full circle then to the temple, uh, because that's where the name of that the Lord wants us to have is found. So, uh, if there's nothing else, uh, we'll then wrap up here. We'd like to thank our participants and their wealth of knowledge and insight. Uh, we're glad that you have shared it with us. Uh, we encourage our audience to, if you're interested in more of these things, uh, there are plenty of other uh, places to look them out. We'll try and put some maybe notes uh, and links to some things if we come to it uh, with this on uh, on its page on mormoninterpreter.com. We encourage you to visit us there. So thank you all, and we will uh, see you again sometime.